everyone, and welcome to our guests who are attending or watching our meeting. Today we're considering two proposals related to the insurance companies subject to the Federal Reserve's oversight. The first is an advance notice of, uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, or ANPR, on insurance capital rules to address the risks for two groups of firms, systemically important insurance companies and other less complex companies that own both an insurance subsidiary and a bank or a savings and loan subsidiary. These groups present different risks to the financial system, and the ANPR outlines two approaches to capital regulation that are tailored to their different risks. The ANPR presents potential capital frameworks that are adapted to the unique nature of the liabilities and risks of companies significantly engaged in insurance activities. Because the ANPR is conceptual, it will allow all interested parties an early opportunity to comment before we turn to developing proposed rules. It's important to note that the frameworks in the ANPR would address all the risks posed across both regulated and unregulated subsidiaries. I believe this proposal is an important step toward capital standards that are both appropriate for our supervised insurance firms and that enhance the resiliency and stability of our financial system. The second proposal before us today is a proposed rule that would establish a range of enhanced prudential standards for systemically important insurance companies. These standards build upon the core provisions of our consolidated supervisory framework for large domestic and foreign banking organizations, but would be appropriately tailored to the business of insurance. Let me now turn to Governor Cerullo, who led the effort to develop these two proposals. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before the staff presentation of the two proposals before us, I wanted to make a few observations on the ANPR, which I think echo uh, some of the themes that you've already struck. Uh, first, as we've done with bank holding companies, the framework envisioned in the ANPR would put in place a tiered approach to capital regulation of insurance firms within our jurisdiction that applies different requirements to groups of firms, which reflects the differences they pose to the uh, different risks they pose to the safety and soundness of depository institutions and to the financial system more generally. Incorporating the tiering principle into financial regulation both promotes achievement of our regulatory mission by applying more stringent regulation to firms that pose greater risk to the system and helps avoid the imposition of unnecessary compliance costs on those that pose lesser risks. Second, the staff has used the flexibility given us by the December 2014 changes to the Collins Amendment to fashion an approach that reflects the ways in which traditional insurance activities differ from those of commercial banks, broker-dealers, and other forms of financial intermediaries. Among the more important of these distinctions is the more stable funding model of traditional insurance businesses. For the current group of a dozen insurance holding companies that we supervise solely because they own a depository institution, the capital requirement would literally build on the requirements placed on the insurance affiliates of the holding company by their insurance regulators. However, even for the firms designated as systemically important, where a more conventional, consolidated approach to capital is needed, and where we would thus create risk categories for assets and liabilities across the holding company, the ANPR contemplates that those risk weights and factors would be designed with insurance activities in mind. Third, and finally, I want to note my agreement with the use of an ANPR as the vehicle for inviting public comment on this dual approach to capital regulation. This is an entirely new approach, and before staff begins the task of fully developing proposed regulatory text, it is important to receive public comment on the overall merits of this approach, as well as suggestions as to how it might best be elaborated. While the use of an ANPR obviously modestly slows down the process of getting a final rule in place, that delay is worth the benefit of our getting our ultimate regulatory regime right. And with that, let me turn to Mark Vanderweide to introduce the staff presentation. Thank you, Governor Trullo. 
The draft insurance rulemakings before the board today represent another example of the staff's commitment to supporting the board's tailored approach to supervision and regulation. Among the institutions that the board supervises, those that significantly engage in insurance activities are different from banks in terms of their business model and risk profile. And the most appropriate supervisory and regulatory approach for these firms is one that best reflects the risks of the business of insurance and is proportional to the threat that the firm poses to financial stability. The board serves as the consolidated supervisor of two general categories of insurance institutions. Those that own one or more insured depository institutions, which I will refer to as insurance thrift holding companies, and those that have been designated as systemically important by the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which I will refer to as systemically important insurance companies. Presently, the population of insurance thrift holding companies consists of 12 firms, while the systemically important insurance companies consist of, of currently AIG and Prudential. The board's supervisory objectives differ for these two populations. For the insurance thrift holding companies, our supervisory efforts have focused on safety and soundness of the consolidated firm and protection of the subsidiary depository institution. For the systemically important insurance companies, our supervision has additionally emphasized a macroprudential perspective, promoting financial stability and mitigating systemic risk. The draft rulemakings before the board today would advance these supervisory objectives. As the chair indicated, the first is an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, or ANPR, on capital requirements for both populations of our supervised insurance firms. And the second is a notice of proposed rulemaking, or NPR, on enhanced prudential standards for the systemically important firms. The rulemakings would support the board's execution of its statutory mandates in a manner that is appropriate for insurance and tailored to the type and systemic footprint of individual firms. They also reflect the hard work of a wide range of Federal Reserve staff some of whom will be presenting to you today, and to have brought a valuable mix of insurance, accounting, regulatory, and legal expertise to this enterprise. Let me now turn the floor over to Tom Sullivan to introduce the ANPR on capital. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> the first draft rulemaking before you today is an advance notice of proposed rulemaking on capital requirements for supervised institutions significantly engaged in insurance activities. This is a topic that staff has been carefully considering for some time, and underlying all of our efforts is a desire to get it right. We have engaged extensively with a variety of stakeholders on these issues over the past few years, and the AMPR reflects our continued commitment to receiving stakeholder input. As you know, an advance notice of proposed rulemaking differs from a notice of proposed rulemaking in, it, in terms of its substance and goals. While an NPR is essentially a draft, a developed draft, a, a, NP, a NPR is a more conceptual outline and as such would invite comments on the broad contours of the capital frameworks before we turn to proposing on details. The draft a NPR discusses two independent capital frameworks appropriate for the business mix and risks profile of our supervised insurance institution. The proposal takes a bifurcated approach with a building block approach favored for insurance thrift holding companies and a consolidated approach for the systemically important insurance companies. We believe that this bifur bifurcated approach is optimal. It would most efficiently advance the board's differing supervisory objectives for the two populations of supervised insurance institutions. I will now turn to Linda Dusick who will discuss the consolidated approach in more detail, followed by Suryash Paliwal, who will discuss the building block approach. Linda. Thank you, Tom. I'll discuss one of the two capital frameworks presented in the ANPR, termed the consolidated approach. The financial crisis demonstrated the need for stronger regulatory and supervisory assessments of the resiliency of large financial firms. <clears throat> Among other things, it revealed that too narrow a focus on the safety and soundness of the individual legal entities in a corporate group could result in a failure to detect threats to the group and to financial stability that emerge from unregulated or less regulated subsidiaries of the group. Indeed, the near collapse of AIG during the financial crisis was precipitated in significant part by activities not within the purview of regulators. Severe losses in a non-insurance subsidiary of AIG undermined confidence in the entire organization and contributed to the firm's inability to obtain adequate funding. Hence, 
the crisis reaffirmed the importance of consolidated supervision, which encompasses the parent company and all of its subsidiaries, and allows the board to understand a supervised institution's activities, resources, and risks from the perspective of the entire enterprise. In addition to building on the benefits of consolidated supervision, a consolidated capital standard deters firms from moving assets among its affiliates <clears throat> in order to take advantage of lower capital requirements at the legal entity level. The ANPR's proposal of the consolidated approach reflects the importance of considering all risks from an enterprise-wide perspective and minimizing regulatory arbitrage. The consolidated approach would also minimize the risks to the safety and soundness of the firm and to financial stability from double leverage. That is, the use by a parent firm of borrowings to fund equity investments and subsidiaries. The consolidated approach would categorize all of the consolidated insurance group's assets and insurance liabilities into risk segments apply risk factors to the amounts in each segment, total these risk-weighted amounts to arrive at consolidated capital requirements, and then set a minimum ratio of consolidated capital resources to the institution's consolidated capital requirements. The consolidated approach would use risk weights or risk factors that are appropriate for the long-term nature of many insurance liabilities. The ANPR invites comment on the consolidated approach as a suitable regulatory capital framework for systemically important insurance companies. In addition to covering all risks and reducing the opportunity for regulatory arbitrage and double leverage, the consolidated approach would more easily enable the board to perform supervisory stress tests. Any implementation costs associated with the consolidated approach should be more than outweighed by the benefits of enhanced resiliency. Because these institutions are large, internally and externally complex, and systemically important, the consolidated approach is more suitable than the building block approach. With that, I turn the floor over to Suyash Palawal for a discussion of the building block approach. Thank Suyash. you. Thank you, Brenda and Tom. I will discuss the second of the two main approaches in the ANPR, termed the building block approach. As its name suggests, the building block approach uses certain building blocks, existing capital requirements for the various legal entities in an insurance group to construct an enterprise-wide capital requirement. This framework reflects an approach that relies, in part, on the state-based capital requirements for state-regulated insurance companies and, in part, on the board's existing bank capital requirements. The building block approach thus aims to achieve an enterprise-wide perspective while utilizing capital requirements already in place. Under the building block approach, the capital requirement for each regulated subsidiary generally would be based on the regulatory capital rules of that subsidiary's lead regulator, whether a state or foreign insurance regulator for insurance subsidiaries, or a banking regulator for depository institutions or other banking subsidiaries. The regulatory capital requirement for any non-insurance, non-banking subsidiaries would be based on the uh, board's existing standardized risk-based capital rules applicable to affiliates of bank holding companies. The building block approach would then aggregate capital resources and capital requirements across the firm's subsidiaries and calculate combined enterprise-wide capital resources and requirements. The comparison of aggregate capital resources to aggregate required capital would represent enterprise-level capital adequacy. In some situations, the subsidiary's legal entity level requirements may need certain adjustments, for instance, to eliminate intercompany transactions. Should the board adopt the building block approach, we would also need to develop a mechanism to harmonize the calibration levels of different regulatory regimes and reflect the board's supervisory objectives. The existing legal entity level capital requirements thus may need to be scaled in order to bring the various building blocks to a comparable basis for aggregation. The ANPR invites comment on the building block approach as a suitable regulatory capital framework for the 12 insurance thrift holding companies supervised by the board. We note that these firms only fall under the board's supervision because they own an insured depository institution. For the insurance thrift holding companies, we submit that the building block approach would streamline implementation costs 
and other implementation burdens, while achieving the board's supervisory objectives of ensuring enterprise-wide safety and soundness and protecting the subsidiary depository institution. Moreover, for these firms, which tend to be smaller and whose failure would have a different impact on the broader economy compared to the systemically important insurance companies, the additional implementation costs of the consolidated approach may outweigh the incremental benefits. Members of the board, we would be delighted to address any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Let me begin by thanking the staff for excellent, excellent work in putting these <coughs> proposals before us. I have uh, two questions. Um, the first relates to international efforts, particularly through the IAIS, that I know has been working uh, for some time to develop an insurance capital standard for internationally active insurance groups. Can you give me a sense for how the proposal that you've put forward um, does or doesn't sync up with uh, the efforts that are going on there? Yes, Chair Yellen. As you know, the Federal Reserve Board is a member of the IES, and we have participated in the work to develop the International Insurance Capital Standard. There are both similarities and differences between what we are proposing today and the ANPR. The consolidated approach does share some similarities with the ICS, but also important distinct differences. Both present a consolidated approach to a group-wide capital requirement. However, there are major differences as well. We are supporting a gap-based framework, and there currently is a, a gap-based valuation framework considered in the ICS. However, there also is a market-adjusted valuation framework that we have great concerns about due to the degree of volatility it introduces. Uh, we support the work of the uh, IIS along with our other American partners, the Federal Insurance Office and state insurance regulators and we look forward to continuing to work on that project for something that can develop eventually into an appropriate international standard. There is a distinct difference between, however, the building block approach and the ICS, given that the building block approach represents an aggregation approach rather than a consolidated approach as the ICS does. And let me ask you one more question. Tom, in your um, opening remarks, you emphasized the staff's been working for a long time to really get this right. And I know one of the um, issues that initially made it difficult to devise a regime that would be right for insurance companies was the Collins Amendment, which was um, modified in 2014 to give the board more flexibility in designing these requirements. And I guess my question would be, do you feel you've had adequate flexibility, or are there still constraints that you've faced in designing a regime you think is appropriate for these companies? We do, Madam Chair. We think we have the flexibility we, we need to move forward. But as we've noted in proposing an AMPR, we do want to seek uh, outsider comment and continue the engagement we've had with stakeholders to make sure we do get it right. Thank you very much. Um, Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, members of the staff, for uh, the very uh, important work you've done in this, uh, this area, which required a lot of thinking about how to regulate insurance companies, which is not something we've done uh, before. Insurance company uh, liabilities are usually longer term than uh, those of other, of, of other financial institutions. Uh, do you think they'll be having for a given uh, asset a lower risk weighting because of the longer horizon than they would have if that was held in a bank? Um, so we definitely need to devise uh, a capital regime both for the systemic firms and for the insurance thrift holding companies that does take into account uh, the different nature of the insurance business model, most notably uh, the different nature of the, uh, of the liability structure. Uh, uh, as Governor Trullo uh, foreshadowed in his opening remarks, uh, the traditional insurance liability is a much longer term uh, liability than the typical uh, bank liability. Uh, and I think uh, staff generally feels that, uh, as a general matter, a firm with more stable funding uh, uh, can face a lower capital requirement. At this point in the ANPR, though, uh, we're not specifying any particular calibration of, of any 
asset risk weight or liability risk weight. Um, but in the next step, when we propose an actual capital rule for these firms, uh, the length of the insurance, the traditional insurance liability will be something that we'll clearly focus on quite a bit. Uh, similarly, for the insurance liabilities, the non-traditional insurance liabilities that can be runnable, um, uh, which are, uh, I think, more of a feature of some of the liabilities of the two systemically important firms, uh, that will also be a factor uh, in the capital requirements that we devise for those two firms to address the, the runnability and the systemic risk created by the runnability of some of their non-traditional liabilities. Thanks very much. Uh, a second question, one you must have thought about all the time you were working on this framework. Uh, if, if the general framework you we're describing here for uh, insurance companies were in place or had been in place uh, just before, say, in, in late August uh, 2008, would you have prevented the uh, bankruptcy of AIG? We do believe that the combination of the two proposals before you um, would have uh, addressed the risks and the stress that was confronted by AIG at the time of the crisis. Taken together, both a consolidated approach to capital, which AIG was not subjected to before, and some of the, uh, the we're going to be talking in a moment about the provisions in the, uh, uh, the notice of uh, proposed rulemaking for enhanced prudential standards, which include risk management and liquidity risk management. Taken together, we do believe that that would have addressed the stresses and, and that was undertaken at AIG. Yes. So the consolidated approach would have taken care of the financial institution that was a section of AIG that was a problem, was the main cause of the problem. Yeah, there were no capital requirements for the financial products division because it was a non-regulated entity uh, that was not contemplated in a, there was no consolidated requirement, so there was no requirement for capital for financial products. And the, the other risk uh, that AIG, another material risk that AIG faced was uh, liquidity risk. So for the CDS products that they sold, they faced uh, substantial uh, margin calls on those products, and they had a substantial run on their securities lending portfolio. The second part of the proposal, the notice of proposed rulemaking on liquidity risk management, will make sure that uh, a future AIG has some kind of a liquid asset buffer to deal with those potential liquidity outflows. And in 2007, AIG was not subject to that sort of a regime. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Governor Kruger. No questions. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Thank you, Madam. And Governor Brainerd. Um, well, uh, thanks to uh, staff for some uh, very nice work. Um, Notice that you uh, made the judgment not to follow um, the approach taken by Europe uh, in solvency two, and I I agree with that judgment. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges that have been encountered with that approach and, and why you decided to take a different direction. Yes, yeah, so Solvency II has been introduced by the European Union. Although it took 15 years to develop, it just became effective January 1st of 2016. Some of our initial reads and responses from companies has been that there's great concern about the volatility because of the market-adjusted valuation. We also have great concern because so much of it uh, includes an internal models-based option insolvency too, and we have great concern about what that does, about the ability to supervise internal models extensively and comparability across firms as well. And it also can lead to uh, a result that reflects a much lower capital requirement than we may think is prudent. Okay. Um, if there are no further questions, what I'd like to do is ask a member of the board to state their uh, position on uh, the set of on the proposals before us, um, Vice Chair. I support the proposals. Madam Chair, I think the um, the bifurcation approach is very appropriate, and uh, that the decision to go with an A and PR is quite sensible, and I'm happy to support the proposal. Thank you. Governor Brainerd. And I su to support um, the proposals by staff. We now need to take up two separate motions. So first, I need a motion to approve publishing for public comment an advance notice of proposed rulemaking relating to capital requirements for supervised institutions engaged in significant insurance activities. So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 
And next, I need a motion to authorize staff to make technical and minor changes to prepare the related Federal Register documents for publication. So moved. Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Thank you. So um, I think we can now move uh, to our second um, matter, the notice of proposed rulemaking. And let me turn to Tom Sullivan to introduce this. Thank you, Madam Chair. During the preceding decades and during the recent financial crisis, a number of insurers experienced material financial distress and had significant deficiencies in the areas of corporate governance and risk management. Moreover, history has demonstrated that insurers may experience failure if they do not manage their liquidity in a prudent manner. The enhanced prudential standards for FSOC designated systemically important insurance companies being considered today would address these key issues. In particular, the standards re require the board of directors and senior management of these companies to adhere to concrete requirements related to corporate governance, risk management, and liquidity risk management. The standards are based on best practices of large, interconnected financial institutions, but with modifications to reflect insurance-centric risk. The systemically important insurance companies each currently meet some, but not all, of these best practices. It is important to note as well that the proposed standards are qualitative and not quantitative in, in nature. Together, these, these standards would be an integral part of keeping systemically important insurance companies strong and resilient to adverse market developments and should contribute to a more robust U.S. financial system and economy. I'll first turn to Noah Cutler to discuss further the corporate governance and risk management standards. Noah? Thank you, Tom. To help ensure strong corporate governance and risk management, the proposal would require all systemically important insurance companies to identify, measure, monitor, and manage risk at an enterprise-wide level. This includes risks that may arise from intragroup transactions, unregulated entities, or centralized material operations. In addition, the proposal would identify the parties responsible for carrying out the company's risk management practices. To that end, the proposal would require the board of directors of these companies to have an independent risk committee that would be responsible for the policies and oversight of the company's global risk management framework. A systemically important insurance company also would be required to have a chief risk officer responsible for implementing and maintaining the company's risk management framework. The chief risk officer would be required to ensure that all risk within the company, regardless of where they were originated or are currently housed, are within the company's overall risk limits. This includes identifying, measuring, and monitoring intra-group risks. In addition, the corporate governance and risk management standard would require a systemically important insurance company to have a chief actuary. These companies have complex balance sheets that depend heavily on estimates of future revenues, the amount and timing of payments, and the reserves that the companies need to meet those payments. Actuaries play a critical role in estimating these amounts. The chief actuary of a systemically important insurance company, therefore, would provide enterprise-wide oversight across the company's legal entities, lines of business, and geographic markets. I will now turn it over to Matt Walker to discuss the liquidity risk management standard. Thank you, Noah. The proposed liquidity risk management standard has been tailored to apply to systemically important insurance companies. Historically, most insurance products created little liquidity risk since their payments were contingent upon the occurrence of specified events, such as the death of a policyholder or the destruction of prop property. However, some insurers today also offer investment and retirement products with account values that can be withdrawn at the discretion of policyholders, sometimes with little or no surrender penalty. The option to surrender creates the potential to strain the liquidity of the firm and adversely affect the broader economy through fire sales and other externalities. To reduce the risk of failure triggered by a liquidity event, the proposed liquidity risk management standard would require a systemically important insurance company 
to implement a number of provisions to manage this liquidity risk. One important requirement of the standard is robust oversight of liquidity risk management by systemically important insurance companies, board of directors, risk committee, and senior management. The proposed rule would also require a systemically important insurance company to produce comprehensive enterprise-wide cash flow projections, maintain a contingency funding plan, and carefully monitor collateral and legal entity liquidity risk. Perhaps the most significant aspect of the proposal is the requirement for firms to conduct regular internal liquidity stress testing. This requirement would be more principles-based than the liquidity coverage ratio rule applied to bank holding companies and does not include Fed prescribed assumptions around surrender rates for various liability types. Related to the internal stress testing requirement, the proposed rule would require a systemically important insurance company to maintain a buffer of highly liquid assets sufficient to meet stressed net cash outflows for 90 days. This 90 day period, which is longer than the 30 day period that applies to bank holding companies, reflects the long term nature of most insurance liabilities. Because this longer time horizon implies more time to convert assets into cash, the proposed rule would consider a relatively wider range of assets as liquid than the rule applied to bank holding companies. The proposal specifies a list of eligible liquidity buffer assets, including most investment grade debt issued or guaranteed by a sovereign entity or US government sponsored enterprise, investment grade corporate bonds, publicly listed common equity shares, and certain investment grade municipal bonds. Members of the board, we would be delighted to address any questions you have. Thank you very much. Let me just take things off with one question. So um, I think the liquidity risk management standards that you've proposed here for these you know, systemically important um, insurance firms are um, you know, a very important risk management tool. But in the case of the large and systemically important bank holding companies, as you mentioned, we do have quantitative requirements, the LCR and the NSFR. So my question would be, do you see this as a first step? And later on, you would contemplate putting in place comparable um, or appropriate quantitative uh, requirements? Or do you think this is um, sufficient in terms of liquidity management? As we've, uh, as we've tried to build out the insurance supervisory and regulatory framework for the 14 insurance focused firms that we have, we have spent a lot of time thinking through whether it makes sense to do some kind of a quantitative liquidity rule um, for the systemically important firms in particular. Um, at this point, we don't have a recommendation to bring you on that. Um, in the near term, we think the right foci uh, for the board are on the capital rules um, for all 14 firms and for the broader enhanced prudential standards for the two systemically important firms. But we do continue to analyze the, the pros and cons of uh, potential future quantitative liquidity rule for the systemic firms. Um, as we approach completion of these two uh, rulemakings, I think we'll come back to the board with a recommendation to you as to whether or not we should do something like that. To the extent we do want to do something like that, it will clearly be far different from a cut and paste of the LCR and the NSFR, the bank-based rules, because of the very different nature of a lot of the insurance liabilities. It will have to be a, a quite different uh, uh, framework to, to, to be appropriate for these firms. But uh, that'll be something we'll come back to you on in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Madam Chair? Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, this is a set of regulations that's going to be relevant to companies which are already regulated on a state uh, basis. How are you, the, the regulations must differ from state to state. How is this going to be coordinated, made to work? So uh, the state supervision focuses on legal entities. Uh, and while some of their supervision is expanding to look at the, the consolidated enterprise, again, the, their authority relies with, with the legal entities. For the two systemic firms that we're talking about here, we would be looking at the totality of the enterprise and making sure that there's liquidity for the consolidated enterprise. So it is distinctive in that manner. Um, you know, we, we think it's in, in particularly important because of the question you asked earlier with respect to the AMPR, that we, again, have a complementary NPR here with uh, a requirement around liquidity risk management. We don't go so far as 
Mark has suggested of you know a, a hard quantitative number, but we do believe that the best practices outlined in this NPR will advance some of the practices of the industry. And, and are there, are there uh, other aspects of what's been done in the case of, uh, of banks, like uh, stress testing, uh, that we're going to require for uh, insurance companies? Yeah, so the, the statute, the Dodd-Frank Act, requires us to impose a uh, large number of enhanced prudential standards on the systemically important insurance companies, any FSOC-designated company. Um, we are in the process of building out that entire framework. Uh, we've put the resolution planning requirements already in place, and the firms have submitted resolution plans that we're looking at. Uh, the NPR before you today is a few more of the Dodd-Frank Act required provisions. Uh, there are several more that will be coming, one of which is the stress testing requirement. And we've been working uh, relatively concurrently on the capital rule and the stress testing framework. Um, Establishing the capital rule is more or less a condition precedent of establishing the stress testing requirement. Stress testing is an assessment of whether the firm can stay above the minimum capital levels in the stress period. So once we get the capital rule in place, we'll be in a position where we can launch the stress testing. But intellectually, we're developing them together at the same time. Uh, so that will be coming, uh, as well as a few other things that are required in the Dodd-Frank Act, like single counterparty credit limits. But many of the additional enhanced prudential standards that we haven't yet completed hinge off of the capital rule, so it's critical to get the capital rule in place so that we can complete the broader set. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Governor Trulli, oh, Governor Pelz, Governor Brennan. Okay. <laughs> Hearing no more questions, um, let me again ask people to state their positions uh, on, on these proposals. Uh, mm -hmm. Vice Chair. Uh, I, I favor these proposals. Thank you. As to as good next step from the supervision that this group has already been providing, and I think part of what this is doing is um, putting into regulatory form some of the practices that you've tried to evolve in the supervision to date. And so I think in the step-by-step -step approach, we're ready for this one, but not for the other things that Mark was talking about. Governor Powell. I support these proposals. Governor Brainerd. And I do as well. And. We now have two separate motions that we need to take up. The first is to approve publishing for public comment a notice of proposed rulemaking to implement enhanced prudential standards for non-bank financial companies with significant insurance activities. I need a motion. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 And now I need a motion to authorize staff to make technical and minor changes to prepare the related Federal Register documents for publication. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So um, the motions are approved. And uh, I know all my colleagues and I want to thank the staff for the very hard work that's gone into this and Governor Trullo and the um, committee for your effort in moving this to completion. Now they can have a good, relaxing week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.